Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the show on this Friday, December 23rd, 2022, almost 2023. Well, I'm going to do a my predictions for 2023 on this show. I'm also going to wish you guys a Merry Christmas, and this is my last show until uh, after Christmas is over. So... Uh, Anyway, it's been a it's been a pretty good year this year, uh, considering the the inflation that we've had, and which I predicted way out into 2021, and and even into I think the latter part of 2019, I was predicting this inflation that we've had in this last year. I also predicted what the Fed was going to do. I said how the Fed was going to. Uh, uh, was going to fight it and then they were going to turn around i predicted the markets are going to go down to twenty six thousand on the dow predictions would haven't happened quite yet we haven't seen twenty six thousand on the dow we've seen uh below thirty thousand in the twenties but we haven't seen twenty six thousand i predicted that twenty six thousand would be the turning point when the fed would come back and restore the markets that they wouldn't let it go below 26,000. And I'm still holding by that. It just that it hasn't happened yet. So that prediction is still in our future. It could happen rather suddenly in 2023. Uh, because of the conditions that they're creating, they are not going to stop tightening until the market cracks. And what I mean by cracks is I mean the Dow drops a lot. And all the other markets, of course, too. They're all going to drop with the Dow. The Dow is not going to drop in a vacuum uh listen guys we got this war situation going on over there and i'm gonna like i said i'm gonna make my predictions for this year something's gonna crack with the war situation this year this is my prediction i think the russians are thinking they they've been thinking in a, in a way that when they first went into ukraine they thought that the ukraine people would just basically bow down and submit them submit to them and welcome them in with open arms and that within two weeks ukraine would be theirs and they went in with this long 40 mile long convoy heading toward kiev initially early in the war and i thought that they i think that they thought that it would be over this massive show of power and the Ukrainian people would just basically welcome them in here. We, we, we want to be part of Russia, just like Crimea was, was welcomed into the Russian fold. All of Ukraine would be welcomed into the Russian fold. It didn't happen that way. They didn't never expected resistance like they've seen in Ukraine. It's completely unexpected. And I think now they think that they, you know how they've been threatening the West and saying, hey, you know, don't bring it, don't interfere. At the very start of this war, uh, Putin sat back and he said, do not interfere in this or it's going to be extreme. What will come will be, basically, I'm not quoting him exactly what he said, but he, he's basically to, saying to the West, you better leave this one alone. Let us fight this war with no, uh, nothing from you to the West, basically what he was saying. So the West interfered anyway. And so he's been threatening the West with these nuclear weapons that came after that, to threaten them with nuclear weapons and stuff. And you know, it's went on and on and on. Oh, it is, you, not, not openly threatened with nuclear weapons, but now it's moved to a new stage where he's actually locking and loading these nuclear weapons in position ready to be fired. This is the next stage. And I think their way of thinking over there in Russia. Now, I could be wrong, totally wrong about this, but this is what I'm predicting for next year. I think their way of thinking over there in Russia is if we fire a couple, just a couple of nuclear weapons, not the, not the tactical nuclear weapons, but the strategic nuclear weapons, just fire a couple of them. And when the West sees how powerful they really are, then they'll submit to us. And this is exactly the way of thinking it was when they rolled into Ukraine with this 40-mile-long convoy. And at the head of the convoy, you know, they had these uh, cars and stuff with, like, Russian flags on them and everything. And, like, 
this is this like convoy you know the old trucker song oh, da, 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 the convoy <laughs> you know and it's like big time it's like roll it in boys you know it's, it's going to be a pushover well i think that they're thinking maybe you know i'm not sure about this well, i'm going to say i'm not sure about but i'm just this in my mind i'm thinking maybe they're thinking that if they just fire a couple of these nuclear missiles the big ones the big ones the west will see these enormous mu mushroom clouds and they'll all bow down and say oh russia we're sorry we didn't mean it we're not going to supply ukraine with any more weapons of vast weapons and stuff that's it we're not going to do any of that anymore and we're, we're going to back off and we're going to let you have ukraine and by the way maybe we'll let you have poland and maybe we'll let you have romania too just to be you know and this is this is a I and mean, you'll be victorious if you just fire a couple of these nuclear weapons that's what would be the way they're thinking now because if they were thinking before that they could just roll on into Ukraine, nothing would happen and everything else, a big show of power, and Ukraine would just bow down and submit to them, maybe they're still thinking that way with these nuclear weapons. The whole world will submit to them if they can just show their power. You ever thought of that? And maybe that's why they're locking and loading a couple of them, the best ones. I think the Sarmats, you know, which is very capable, and it's not a... It's not a, uh, uh, a tactical nuclear weapon. It's a strategic nuclear weapon. Well, you know, I don't think it might, if they do something like that, I'm just saying if, because I don't know. I'm just guessing at all this, you know. I'm just thinking maybe that's the way they're, th the way they're thinking because that's the way. That, why I'm guessing that is because that's the way they were thinking at the beginning of the war. And so what would change? It's the same people. The top command in Russia was thinking that way, that Ukrainians would all bow down and submit to them and it would all be over in two weeks. So why wouldn't they be thinking the same way now, that maybe if they just drop a couple big nukes, big ones, that the whole West will just bow down and submit to them? Maybe that's the way they're still thinking, because if they were thinking that way before, why wouldn't they think that way again? But that's a very dangerous way of thinking. Much more dangerous than their original convoy into, into, into Kiev. Because I can tell you probably what will happen if they do that is the West would probably hit them with a full response. And they, I heard that in Russia over right now, they're preparing their bunkers and everything. Maybe they should continue preparing their bunkers and really maybe they should dig their bunkers a little bit deeper underneath the ground. Maybe they should go down at least 30 stories deep. Because I'm going to tell you what, the West has got some horrific weapons. The Russians think they got the best weapons, and maybe they do have good weapons. The Sarmat's nothing to, nothing to sneeze at. But, you know, Sarmat, that's what they call, uh, was it the Satan, Satan 2 or whatever they call it. It's nothing to sneeze at. It's a powerful weapon. But, you know, over here in the West, they've been developing weapons for years. Weapons that can even reach down into the ground and dig you out. It's a frightful thing, but, you know, to think that all of this could have been avoided just with a few bit of paperwork or some just some of these leaders just sitting around a table and talking a little bit, saying, hey, why do we need to do all this foolishness? But they didn't do that in World War II. They didn't sit around a table and talk it out. They fought it out, and I'm, I'm worried that they're going to fight it out again. So, so thinking about 2022, this, this could end in one of two ways. So I think it's all going to come to a head in 2023, and this is my prediction, guys, for 2023. I think this is all going to come to a head. The war in Ukraine is going to come to a head in 2023. And it's going to go in, in off in maybe one of several different directions. One of the directions could be nuclear war, and that's the direction we don't want to see. But that's not the only direction this thing could swing. Another direction it could swing is the the uh, the uh, Russian government could like the whole thing could just Russia could collapse, just basically just fall apart. That's another way it could end. Uh, there's several different directions it could end in, but my prediction is that the whole thing is going to come to a head in 2023. 
one way or another. Uh, maybe with failed attempts to take Ukraine, or maybe they'll succeed in taking Ukraine, or just. But the whole thing's going to come to a head next year. That's my prediction. And so you got to be prepared for that because it could be devastating, or it could be something good. I, I mean, it could be the end of the war, and not as a nuclear war. But either way, it's probably going to come to a head. And what I mean by that is, the war in Ukraine is probably going to end in 2023. I don't, I don't think it's going to carry on past that. And I think the financial system. Just think what would happen to the financial system of the world if there was a big nuke go off. You know, we've had big nukes go off in the past. Now, in around 1960, we had an enormous nuke go off from the former Soviet Union. It was called the, the TZAR bomb or bomba it was a monster guys it was the biggest bomb ever exploded above ground and I mean you wouldn't survive this thing if you were 10 miles away from it when it exploded you would be vaporized that's how big it was and the people that were dropping it with the airplane it what they weren't sure whether they would survive but they gave the thing a parachute to slow down its descent to give the airplane time to get away and the airplane you know when it was leaving the the, the site as fast as it could and it was going almost like Mach 1 or whatever it was just shooting through the sky as fast as it could to get away after it dropped this thing right they got they got like miles and miles away because they were flying like a mile every few seconds like five seconds or something for a make up a mile they were going that fast and, and they gave themselves like minutes to get away. But still, they just barely got away from the percussion of the thing. When percussion of the thing, that thing hit, they lost altitude in a big way. They almost crashed them. They just barely got away from this thing. And the blast was so intense. It just lit up. They had to have special goggles on and everything because it just lit up the sky so bright when it went off. All right? So that was the biggest weapon. So the weapons they got aimed at us aren't near that big. But they're still big. See, that was like 50 megatons. Or 50. Counted as 50. Well, most of the weapons they have in the arsenals now are less than one. You know, they're, they're, they're like a half of a megaton. But when you consider that Hiroshima was very... And, and Nagasaki and Japan were very small in comparison to what they have now. What they have now is like maybe a half of one. Right? We're talking megatons. Well, you go down to the kiloton measurement. That's that's much smaller. And, and Nagasaki and, and the weapons they got now are about 18 times more powerful than Hiroshima. And so, roughly, the survival place you need to be, uh, pretty much, if you want to survive, you got to be at least three miles away from Ground Zero with these ones they have now. Otherwise, if you're if you're closer than three miles, if you're only a mile away from ground zero, your your chances are very slim. If you're only a mile away, unless you're protected underneath the ground or something, and oftentimes too, if you're too close, if you're underneath the ground, if you're too close to ground zero, even if you're underground, what happens is it sucks all the, it sucks all the air away, and all it leaves is carbon monoxide. Or carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide and these obnoxious gases you know uh, it's very difficult to survive the thing if you're if you're not in a if you're not further than three miles away because the shock wave hits and about three and a maybe four miles away the shock wave loses a lot of its intensity and so if you're six miles away you're probably going to survive it but it's probably going to break the windows in your house at six miles away and at 10 miles away uh, then you're still going to get burns on your skin if you're outside you know like your face will all be sunburned like really burned the, the fa part that's facing the explosion don't look at it you'll get blinded like at 10 miles away if you look at it uh, if you see that sudden bright bright everything goes bright right drop to the ground and cover your head just like they told you but in the movies, you know, drop to the ground, cover your head, try to pull your clothing up over yourself because if you don't, your ears will all get burned from the brightness of it, the flash, right? 
If you cover yourself quick, you might keep yourself from being burned, from third degree burns, if you're 10 miles away, you know. And then, 15 minutes later, you got 15 minutes to get the hell out of there and find some place where you can avoid the radiation fallout, which lasts about two days, two or three days, in its intensity that'll give you radiation sickness. You need a cover, you need to find cover, you need to get inside a house or inside something, if you're, even if you're 10 miles away. You know, and uh, you know, I mean, uh, they got like a thousand of these things aimed at us over here, but that doesn't mean a thousand's going to hit. And most of them would be aimed at the nuclear silos that we have, the land based nuclear silos that we have over here. That's where most of them will go. And if you're in those areas, you're going to get peppered really hard with, you know. But anyway, I'm digressing here. I don't really think that that is going to happen next year. I think something somehow is going to save us. Maybe it's just calmer heads out there. Maybe it's just not the people who are just wanting war so bad. They're, and they are out there. I don't know what you'd call those certain depraved people that are out there that really and are in power and they really want us to have World War Three. And there are a number of them out there. you got to be aware of them. Because they they are they want world war they want to decimate they want to see the whole world blow up and they want humanity to disappear off the earth so the earth can be pristine again so that wildlife can flourish and everything else but no man's do you think I'm lying you think there's people out there that do not want that they they do there's a whole groups of them out there who want to see every last person on earth perish so there's no humans humans anymore. And these are humans that want this, if you can believe this. But they are out there. They, they are, uh, I can't remember what they're called, but they, they don't want any humans left on the earth. They want us all to go extinct. They want that. It's amazing, you know? But they actually want that. Now, my question is, is, is they want, they're very concerned. Generally, these people are very concerned about the environment and stuff, the ones that want humans gone. And my question is, is if there's no humans left, we're all gone. And what's left on the earth? I don't know. Maybe some wildlife. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe the earth will be beautiful again. Maybe it'll just be a Garden of Eden. But there's nobody here. Well, my question is, is there's probably a million other planets out there that are just like that, just beautiful. So we will be one million and one, planet number one million and one. Instead of there being uh, one million of these planets that are beautiful and ready for life, which they just found two of them quite recently, two new ones out there, of these planets. I think they're like 100 light years from here. And they're beautiful, they're full of water, and they're beautiful planets. So there's like a million of them out there. So we'll be one million and one, and there'll be nobody on these planets. They're empty. What's the point? Nobody can see it anyway. Nobody can observe the beauty. So what? So it's beautiful. I would prefer to have our planet full of people that can witness it, even if it's even if it's been roughed up a bit. Like right now, it's roughed up a bit. Even if it does get roughed up a little bit more, if there's people here to observe it. Rather than everybody dead and nobody here to observe it, what's the point then at that point? See, that's my logic. My logic is the only point of having a planet is to have some people on it who can witness uh, what the planet's happening on the planet. To me, that's just logical. Anyway, I'm getting off on a little bit of a tangent here, but. Suffice to say, uh, next year I predict that the financial system is going to undergo a trauma, probably early in the year, probably in the first two quarters. Now I'm being a little bit, I'm, I could actually narrow it down, I think it's probably going to happen in the first quarter, but it could extend out into the second. It's going to suffer a trauma, the financial system. And then what we're going to see is the central banks come into the rescue, like they always do. And then we're going to see uh, in massive inflation start. 
And that's when we're going to see uh, gold and silver really shine. Like they've never shined before. And if you're not in, then you're going to be left behind. Because I'll tell you what, the train's going to leave one of these days for gold and silver. And I know I've been preaching that for a long time, but we've been through a long, long, long miserable period with gold and silver where they've had very tight control in the West over the markets. And they're, they're slowly losing that control, losing that grip, along with the loss of the petrodollar, the strength of the petrodollar. I heard this morning that it's massive overseas. They're leaving the, they're pulling out of the U.S. dollar massively. In uh, many different countries, they're looking for anything else that they can trade in other than the U.S. dollar. Well, you know, the people over here in the West who are in charge, they saw this coming for quite a while ahead of time. They knew this was coming. And they didn't damn well want them to go to Bitcoin. And that's why they pulled the plug on Bitcoin. They didn't completely pull the plug on it, but they pulled the plug somewhat. And this has been a plug pull. This has been a rug pull out from underneath Bitcoin. And that's the reason why. They didn't want these countries over there in the East, the BRICS nations and all the, all the Eastern countries, turning to Bitcoin as a means of exchange. And they were starting to there, back when Bitcoin was up at 68,000. Now that Bitcoin's lost its win, basically the bubble's been popped, you don't see that happening any longer. And I think that they, were, and they knew about that and they did it ahead of time. And I think, but they didn't kill it. You notice they didn't kill it? That's because Bitcoin is, is going to come back, guys. And, and, you know, when something is unwanted and unloved, that's the time when you think about getting in. Uh, absolutely don't sell it. I wouldn't sell it right now. I certainly wouldn't be selling it. Not at these prices. This is terribly low right now for cryptos, all the cryptos at the rock bottom price. Well, I shouldn't say they're rock bottom. They do have a bit of room to go lower. But the, and the, when this financial stress comes that I told you about, in other words, this, this impact that's going to hit the financial system in the first two quarters of this year, we could see cryptos go lower. And you could see it affect gold and silver a little bit too. It's the latter half of 2023, I'm predicting, that gold, silver, and cryptos are going to do very, very well indeed. And the dollar is going to do very poorly. Worse than we've seen yet. Okay, so those are my predictions for 2023. Uh, will we have nuclear war? Well, that's up in the air. I think that if a nuclear war does start, I think that the terror that comes from that will very possibly limit it. In other words, when the first of the mushroom clouds start to go off, there's going to be a panic go out through the system, and that panic is going to yield terror, even in the hearts of the, of the elite. And that might bring it to a stop before it actually... Almost like, you know, I mean, kids out there, they like big firecrackers. So they light a big firecracker, right? And the fuse is burning. Psh! That's where we are with the nuclear thing right now. And what happens is at that last second, <clears throat> the firecracker might even spitter and sputter a little bit. And then the fuse goes, psh! Burns out. Right? Or it could explode. And that's where we're going with the nuclear thing. The whole thing could just, psh! Burn out. And be over right uh, or at that last second oh I'm talking about the second that's when it comes down to the wire always on something like this it comes down to that last little bit when maybe the first bombs are going off and everybody's like oh my god what have we done will they continue or will they shut it down at that point will calmer heads prevail and that's the big question mark because their necks are on the line too and they realize that they're not complete moron well they maybe they are <laughs> no but no but their necks are on the line too and they're probably more frightened to die than the rest of the ordinary guys out there you know like you and me and everybody else out here in our audience here they're, the the elites of the world are probably more frightened and they frighten easier and so when the when the strategic nuke starts to actually fly 
and probably tactical ones too, then there's going to be a little period there where it might just fizzle out. Just like the firecracker just goes and it burns out. You know? Or it could explode. You just don't know. And we've got ourselves in this situation where we just don't know which way this whole thing is going to flop. But so, see how dangerous this is? And how dangerous these weapons are? Why do we build them in the first place? It's time for us to go back to what we were doing before all this started. And that was eliminating the nuclear arsenals. And that's what I'm going to end my show on. It's time for us to go back to that. To making treaties between the superpowers. To say, hey... Let's uh, limit our arsenals down, our nuclear arsenals. Let's destroy a lot of our nuclear weapons. Let's, let's tone it down a little bit before we blow ourselves to bits. Okay, thank you guys for listening. Like and subscribe. We'll catch you guys in the next show. Bye-bye.